Amen. All right, Romans chapter 11. There's a lot there. Romans chapter 11. Okay, so in Romans chapter 11, Paul is, is putting a cap on this thought that he's been having in Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11, talking about Israel, his people. Paul was a Jew. Paul was a Pharisee. So Paul was a Jew, he said, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Jew. And in, in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, and Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about the nation of Israel and the state of the nation of Israel. Now what I want you to do tonight is I want you to just kind of, it's really not that hard to understand what the Bible's saying in Revela or, uh, Romans chapter 11. I just gave away where I'm going tonight. Uh, but there's a lot of false doctrine that's pulled out of Romans chapter 11. So I'm going to try to you know, point out and, and kind of get rid of some of that false doctrine, but I want to also not chase too many rabbits tonight. I want to explain what Romans chapter 11 is actually saying verse by verse. Okay, So look down at Romans chapter 11 and verse number 1. And the Bible reads, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He continues, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What, what ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to, ba uh, to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. So in verse number one, Paul says, has God cast away his people? God forbid. And then he gives it a comparison of Elias or Elijah in the Old Testament. The story of Elijah in the Old Testament, if you remember, we don't have time to go there, but basically Elijah went and he challenged the prophets of Baal. The nation of Israel had, had gone astray and they were chasing after false gods and he challenged all these prophets of Baal to this, you know, this challenge you know, to try to you know, call down fire on this sacrifice. And the thing I love about it is you know, he has these guys are like they're cutting themselves and they're trying to get Baal to, to light this sacrifice on fire and they all fail. And then Elijah has, you know, he has the, the bullock put up there and he, has, he digs a trench around it and he's like, just soak it with water. And they soak it with water like three times and then they fill the whole trench around it with water and then Elijah calls, calls asks God and this fire comes down from heaven and just cooks the whole thing. Then Elijah kills all the prophets of Baal. And after this, um, you know, the wonderful uh, Jezebel, King Ahab's wife, basically comes after Elijah to try to kill him. So Elijah flees for his life, and this is where Elijah, you find him, he's depressed, he's sitting alone, and, he, and he's, he says to God, I'm the only one that's left. You know, just he's depressed, and he's just at the end of, it, of his rope, you know, and he just says, I'm the only one that's left. And God says, no, you're not the only one that's left. He says, there's 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, there's millions of people in the nation of Israel at that time, so that wasn't a lot of people. But there was still a remnant. There was still people who had not gone astray, is what God said. That is the comparison that, God, or that Paul is giving here. Okay? He's saying, has God cast away his people? And he uses the comparison that, no, because there's still 7,000 men. There's still a remnant, is what the Bible is saying here. And it, at this present time, if you look down to verse number 5, so basically verses 2 through 5 explain verse number 1. Okay, So it says in verse number 5, even so at this present time, in Paul's time, also there is a remnant. A remnant according to what? A remnant according to the election. And here's one, one thing I want you to remember when we hear this word election. Because a lot of false doctrine is brought out when you, know, you hear the word election. Oh, that you were elect, that you were chosen by God. Yeah. Election of what? Election of grace. Amen. So the election means, and then read into, um, go down and look at verse number 6. The Bible says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say, uh, go back to Romans 9. And we'll look at verse number 6 in Romans 9. So God always leaves a remnant, okay? That's the point, that the first point we're trying to make here is because 
not all of Israel believed on Jesus Christ. But there was a remnant according to the election of grace. Look at Romans 9 and verse number 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall the seed be called. So you see that God has always been pruning the tree, so to speak. So he did the same, he's talking about the same thing here. Now, the first point tonight I want to make is that there's a remnant and that this chapter is talking about mainstream Israel. Okay, This chapter, Paul is talking about the mainstream of the nation of Israel not accepting Christ. Okay, There was a remnant. There was people that did accept Christ, that had the election of grace. But in general, the mainstream of the Jews rejected Jesus. They did not accept him as the Messiah. Okay, Now you say, what is the mainstream? Because there's a mainstream today. There's a mainstream today, you know, the mainstream media, the, the Fox News and the CNNs and all this. The mainstream today is people who are arguing politics and spending their life watching football and, you know, wasting their life and not doing anything, right? You are not the mainstream. You are the remnant today. The, the believers on Jesus Christ. You're, you're, the, you're the small minority, but you're the remnant, okay? So the mainstream of the Jews did not accept Jesus Christ. We see that. Look down at verse number 6. I'm going to reread verse number 5. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The election of grace. And then verse number 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. There's that pesky gospel again in Romans. I mean, every single chapter in Romans, it, it, he's preaching the gospel again and again. So the election is the election of grace. That means it's all Christ. And what verse number 6 means is that it can't even be a little bit by works. Otherwise, it's no more grace. And if it's by grace, it's, it's not of works. It's one or the other. That's what Romans 11 and verse 6 is saying. So that defines what this election of grace is. So the remnant, the Jews, that were part of the remnant, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? But that was not the mainstream. Look down at verse number 7. What then? Israel hath not tamed, obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So this election of grace obtained it, and the rest were blind. Look at verse number 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day, Paul's day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Turn to Psalm 69. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. So he references something that David said. So let's look at what David said in Psalm chapter 69. Psalm chapter 69. Look at verse number 22. We see these words from David where the Bible says, Let their table become a snare before them, that, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. And then we see, I'm going to read a few more verses of Psalm 69 so you can see David is cursing these people here. In verse 24 he says, Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him who thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Boy, that's a, that's a hefty, those are some strong words that David uses there. But we see here that, you know, they, the ones that, the, that aren't of the remnant have this spirit of slumber. Their eyes, they cannot see, it says, and they can't hear with their ears unto this day. And then David says, a snare, a trap, a stumbling block. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Now, I didn't go into this on purpose in, in Romans chapter 9, but we need to look at 
at something um, in David's words and Paul's words here because there's a lot of false doctrine pulled out of this as well. So go to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 14. And let's look at this um, verse number 9 where it says, And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. In Isaiah, he's referencing Isaiah 8 where Isaiah says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is a prophecy about the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 8. Where it says, you know, it's a stone of stumbling or a stumbling block. And then we see this phrase, a rock of offense. What I'm trying to get at is Jesus is many times in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New, referenced as a rock, as the rock, okay? And when you look at, um, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at the New Testament. So we see that Jesus is called a stone of stumbling, and he's called this rock of offense, because he was a rock of offense to the Jews, the mainstream Jews of that day. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8, let's start reading at verse number 7. The Bible reads, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling. See, we see that, that phrase again. And what? A rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were also disappointed. Or were appointed, I'm sorry. Jesus is the rock that's being discussed here. Okay? So you say, why is this important? We'll turn to Matthew 16. Here's the false doctrine that's taken out of this that we can use this to disprove. Turn to Matthew 16 and look at verse number 18. You see, to some, he was a stumbling stone. To some, he was a rock of offense. But he wasn't in 1 Peter 2, 7, unto therefore which believe he was precious. But to some, he was a rock of offense. So you see differences there. And what was the difference? Belief or unbelief? Right. It's that simple. Okay? Look at Matthew 16 and verse number 18. And the Bible says, Jesus says this. He says, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, who's the rock? Jesus. Amen. Right? Now, the Catholics will tell you that, you know, this is Jesus calling Peter the rock, and that Peter is the leader of the church on earth, thus the first pope, which, you know... What? I mean, I can see how you could take one verse out of context, but it makes no sense. You don't hear it in any part of the Bible anywhere else. But other places in the Bible, we could go studying how Jesus is the rock for the entire sermon. Okay? And I'm only showing you a few verses here. But we see that Jesus is the rock, and Jesus is telling Peter that upon myself will build this, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because I am the rock. Amen. That's what Jesus is saying, okay? Now, do you think it's possible? Here's the irony of this whole thing. That the rock of offense, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses number 7 and 8, guess who wrote that? Peter, right? So do you think it's possible that before Peter wrote his epistle that he misunderstood who the rock was and then he got it right after it? No, no. I mean, Peter knew who the rock was. It proves it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Peter himself knew, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that Jesus Christ was the rock of offense. Jesus Christ was the rock. We just looked at Ephesians 5. Turn to Ephesians 5. We just talked about marriage last Sunday. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Amen. It's real simple. Nowhere in the Bible is this stupid idea that Peter is to be head of the church or some pope or anything like that. Amen. Okay? All right. Let's not get too far off on, on trails here. So, instead of the Jews using Jesus Christ as their cornerstone... 
to build their nation and to build, you know, it, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of my religion, Amen. of your religion. Amen. He is the head of this church. Amen. And instead of using it as their cornerstone, they tripped over it, is basically what Paul is saying. They tripped over it because of their unbelief. It's really not that complicated. All right? Paul's just explaining here that the Jews, they, they missed the bus. You know, they missed the bus on the Messiah. It's a, it's a bad bus to miss. All right? Look at Romans 11 and verse number 11. Paul continues, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I prov might, may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, the Jews, and might save some of them. Provoke to emulation, turn to Acts chapter 8. Provoke to emulation means that they would follow my example of believing on Jesus. So Paul believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He's saying, hey, by all these Gentiles that were going out and were getting saved, hopefully that will provoke some of the Jews to emulate us, to understand that, hey, jealousy, they'll be jealous. We, we want to know what they know, and they'll hear the gospel, and they will get saved as well. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Let's look at what happened in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, I just want to read one verse, verse number 1. Stephen has just been killed in the book of Acts. At the end of chapter 7, Stephen um, had his wonderful sermon and then he was stoned to death. Okay, he was killed. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, in verse number 1, this is Paul before he was converted. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death, unto Stephen's death. Paul was there when Stephen was killed. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So after the stoning of Stephen is when all the Christians started scattering. And that's where you saw all the different churches pop up. That's where you see the church of Antioch start. That became Paul's um, home base, where he took his missionary journeys out of Antioch all the time. But they were forced out to the Gentiles, largely because of persecution from the Jews. Yep. So he's saying that hopefully Paul still has a heart for his people. He's saying hopefully you know, they'll be provoked unto jealousy because we're taking the gospel to the Gentiles and they will we'll be able to save some, he said. Okay? The gospel was going out everywhere. All right? Because of the persecution of the Jews. You won't find any other persecution in the book of Acts except for from the Jews. Okay? Of course, after 870 A.D., then the Romans stepped in and started persecuting the Christians. But as of right now, it's the Jews. Right. Look at Romans 11, verse 15. For if the casting away of them be of reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be but, but life from the dead? R recognize again, he's talking about the nation of Israel as a whole, the mainstream nation of Israel. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafting it among them, and with them partaker, partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. So Paul is using this analogy of grafting um, the Gentiles into, you know, the root of, you know, God's people, basically. Okay? Remember when he said they're not all of Israel that, you know, that say they're of Israel? He's talking about, you know, this root, this remnant, the people that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these Gentiles that believe are being grafted into the tree. Okay? It's a good analogy. I mean, we, we went to this underground place here in Fresno where this guy dug a bunch of tunnels underground. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. But that being said... He dug all these things underground, and he made this little house underground, and he was really good at, like, you know, horticulture, I guess you would call it. But he grafted, he had all kinds of trees that could grow all different kinds of fruit 
on one tree because he grafted a branch in on, you know, from a lemon tree to an orange tree and all this type of thing. So that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about there's a remnant, you know, the, the Jews, the mainstream Jews were cut off, that branch was cut off because of their unbelief. Not because of who they were or the nation that they came from. Because they rejected the Messiah, they were cut off and the Gentiles were grafted in. Okay? And he's saying, hey, if we can save some, you know, maybe we can, you can be grafted in again. You know? I mean, he's talking about the nation. Okay? He's not talking about getting cut off and then being grafted in. This isn't about individual salvation. Okay? All right, he's just talking, he's using an analogy here. Look down at verse number 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise... Uh, oh, did I skip uh, verse 20? Go back up to verse 20. Why were they broken off? I already said that, but well, because of their what? Unbelief. They were broken off. And thou standest, and thou, you, he says, standeth by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So Gentiles, they, they need to believe as well. Okay? So there, there's, not, there's no nation that is to get high-minded and believe we're God's people. And, you know, it's all about belief or unbelief of the individual person. Period. All right? Now, look at verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Now, this is talking about the nation. All right? He's talking about the belief of the nation. Individual salvation has always been the same. The Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. Go to John 10, 28. John 10, 28. John 10, 28, the Bible says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible clearly teaches that salvation, once you have it, once you believe, you hath everlasting life. And God holds your salvation. No man, including yourself, can pluck it out of God's hand. Right. Period. It's very clear throughout the Bible. You know, my, one of my favorite verses in, the, in John 3 is, you know, John 3.18, actually. Yeah. And the reason I like John 3.18 so much is because it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. So why, why are you condemned? Because you have not believed. Yeah. All right? We, when I was a Lutheran, I, one of the biggest questions that I had for my pastor before I... I left the Lutheran church and ended up getting saved was just one of the biggest contradictions in my own mind is I asked my Lutheran pastor, I said, where in the Bible does it say or demonstrate or explain or show somebody being born again and then again and then again and then again? It doesn't. You won't find it anywhere. It's eternal life. If you get a gift that's eternal, you only have to get it one time. And the Bible says that you will never lose it. In Matthew 7, in Matthew 7, Jesus says that to those people who came to him and said, look at all the works that we have done. Look at all the wonderful things that we've done in your name. Lord, Lord, they called him Lord. He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. Yeah, that's, right. that's it. It's not like he didn't say, I, I used to know you, and then I forgot about you, and then I knew you again, and then I forgot you, and then I knew, oh, yeah, I knew you again. No, he said, I never knew you. It didn't matter that those people called him Lord, that they were thinking that they were serving him. They had not, they had not put their faith on him. Their faith was in their own works. Period. And he never knew them. Because once he knows you, folks, he knows you. That's it. Look down at verse number 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, 
which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So Jews can get saved if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, right. That's it. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, we've got to stop here for a little bit. And the Bible, let, me, let me just read tw verse 26. And then the Bible says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Turn to Acts 28. So let's look at this blindness in part first. Okay? Blindness in part. I, I love how... how thorough the Bible is in its, in its wording. This is why you have to have a King James Bible in your hand, because these tiny little words like in part, they make it true or not. Blindness in part has happened to Israel, because that matches the beginning of the chapter where he talks about, you know, it's just blindness in part, because there's a remnant. Remember? There's a remnant. So blindness in part has happened to Israel. Look at Acts 28, verse number 26. So the Jews are blind in part. This is talking about the mainstream Jews, the unbelieving Jews. Blindness is part, in part has happened until this fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Okay, But let's look at the blindness first. Verse number 26, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their own eyes, lest they should see with their own eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Look, he's quoting Jesus here in Matthew 13, where Jesus said this, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing they shall, they shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross. What have I said again and again and again? Let's just, I'll stop reading there, I'll just explain it to you. Belief is a heart issue. If somebody grows up, and they have God, God has the law written in their heart, and they grow up in this creation. This is Romans 1 right here. This is why no one has an excuse. Because God wrote the law in everyone's heart. Amen. And then they're living in this, they see the creation all around them. But if they grow up and they sear their heart, and they sear their conscience over time, and then someone comes to them with the gospel, they won't hear it because their heart has grown, has waxed hard. And it won't fit. Someone whose heart is not waxed hard when you come up to them and say, hey, you know, would you like to hear how to get to heaven? The Bible tells you you can know for sure. And they say, yeah, they'll, they'll believe it because it's the Word of God. And the Word of God has power. Yeah. But people whose heart has waxed hard will not believe. And pretty soon, this is why Jesus said that he spoke in parables. Pretty soon, God will not want them to believe anymore. Yep. That's why with Pharaoh... It was, you know, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. The plague, the next plague, the next plague, the next plague. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then pretty soon it was God that was doing the hardening. Because he's like, you're done. I'm done with you. So God can give up on people. God can turn people over. It's very clear in the Bible. It's a scary thought. But this is the reprobate doctrine right here. Okay? So the heart, their heart was hardened. And this is, why, this is why Jesus said again and again when he was talking, he said, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Because the Jews at that time, they did not want to hear. And that's why you saw in many places in the Bible when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the Bible says they could not believe. I mean, think about it. Jesus is doing miracles right in front of their face. He's, he's raising people from the dead. And the first thing that these Pharisees, they're not getting together going, uh, how did he do that? He just raised a guy from the dead. He's healing all these sicknesses. He's having people get up and walk. He's making blind people see. They're not sitting there going, how's he doing this? They said, no, we've got to kill him. Yep. Because their heart was hard. They could not 
believe. Amen. They couldn't believe. They asked Jesus, why are you talking parables? He's like, because I don't want them to believe. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And he didn't want us to be speaking the word of God to them. And these Pharisees, these unbelieving Jews who had rejected him, and had them believe, he did not want them to believe at this point. Because they rejected him. He that hath ears to hear, let them hear. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. It's not me. When you go out, it's not you. It's the word of God that has power to get people saved. So the Jews, you saw David. The Jews have been cursed. Turn to Matthew 27. The Jews have been cursed not only by David, but look in Matthew 27. You know, this isn't mainstream, what you're hearing today, but this is the Bible. Amen. Matthew 27, look down at verse number 22. The Jews have been cursed, and they literally asked for it. They literally asked for it. Look at Matthew 27. This is Pontius Pilate. He wants to let him go. He wants to let Jesus go. He, he's like, this guy, this guy, there's nothing wrong here. He's done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Pontius Pilate's wife even said, I had a dream. Stay away from, stay away from the, the blood of this innocent man. Don't have anything to do with this. Look at verse number 22. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say to him, Let him be crucified. These are the Jews. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Ye see to it. Then answered all the people and said, these are all the Jews, his blood be upon us and on our children. They asked for it. Now, look, I believe you see effects of this curse today. If you're, if you're a seasoned soul winner and you've gone out, look, I have talked to thousands of people all across the world. I have gotten, I've given the gospel to Mormons. I've given the gospel to Jehovah's Witnesses. I've given the gospel to all sorts of weird cult following people. And not all of them got saved, but I've been able to give the gospel to Muslims and all, all sorts of different religions. I have never been able to even open my Bible to someone who claims to be Jewish. And I'm sure there are Jewish people that can get saved. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that their, their religion today is very hard-hearted against the gospel. And you will find that when you go soul winning. It is very difficult to get someone who follows the religion of Judaism to, to be able to give them the gospel and for them to believe it. I believe we see the, the results of this curse even to this day. To this day. Now... Turn to Luke 21. What does this mean until? Because it says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. What does that mean? Let's go and look at Luke, Luke chapter 21. When is the fullness of the Gentiles? That's what we need to know. Because blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile comes in. Right? Christian churches today say that, you know, there's going to be a time in the end times where just like all of a sudden all the Jews just get saved. Or, I don't know, there's some Christian, Christian pastors out there that, that teach that the Jews don't even need to believe in Jesus because they're God's chosen people, and which is not true at all. And they just, there's different rules for them. You know, I, I don't, it's not in the Bible, but that's what people are teaching. So let's look. What we need to know is when this time of the fullness of the Gentiles is. Okay? Let's look at Luke 21. Let's start reading it at verse number 7. Where the Bible says, that They asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? They're asking him about the end times. And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. 
but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall, be, shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. So there's going to be this great, you know, tribulation, this great time of trouble for Christians, okay? And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then ye know that the desolation thereof is nigh. This is talking about the abomination of desolation. Okay? Then, I'll explain this. I just want to, just let me read uh, the, the next few verses. Then let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these days, these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now notice that in verse 13 it says, It shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts. I will give you a mouth of wisdom. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to believers here. All right. Now look what he says in verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. This, this, these are the people in Jerusalem. These are the Jews right here. When he says them. Because first he was talking about you. They're going to kill you. And then he starts talking in the third person about these people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This is the time of the Gentiles. So when is this? Verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and upon all the distress of the nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Um, verse 27, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, cl in, the cloud, in a cloud with power and great glory. This is the resurrection. This is the rapture right here. Okay? So he's saying that this fullness of the Gentiles come in is this middle of Daniel's 70th week. We're not going to preach on Daniel's 70th week, but this, the abomination of desolation happens right in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. And then after that, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And after that, Jerusalem is compassed with armies, it's destroyed, and that is called the fullness of the Gentiles when they crush Jerusalem. Okay? So the fullness of the Gentiles is in the end times. So what does it mean that all of Israel shall be saved? Here's our first clue. If you look back at verse 26, let me just read it for you if you're not there. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Who is the deliverer? Turn to Psalm 18. So we see that blindness in part is happening to Israel until this time of the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, which we know is at the end, end in the end times, in Daniel's 70th week. And the Bible says in Psalm 18 and verse 2, the Lord is my what? The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer. Amen. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. So in verse, verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 26, when he talks about there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. So we see that the fullness of the Gentiles comes in right at the time of the rapture, and then that's right at the abomination of desolation with Mark almost the center of Daniel's 70th week. And then what does it mean that all Israel shall be saved? Are you in Revelation 11? Revelation chapter 11, look at verse number 1. And the Bible reads, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. 
But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. So the Gentiles are going to trod Jerusalem underfoot for three and a half years. Amen. That's after the rapture, after the resurrection, and we're out of here. Okay? And then I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Of course, the, the two witnesses come in at the second half of Daniel's 70th week. Wrath of God is poured out. Um, but what happens after that? Does anyone know? So all Israel shall be saved. And that three and a half years later is the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. And look down at Matthew, uh, turn to Matthew um, chapter 19. This is, this, this is the whole answer right here. Matthew 19, verse 28 wraps it up. Matthew 19, verse 28. Is everybody there? I want to make sure you're there before I read it. Matthew 19 and verse 28, the Bible reads, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that, when ye, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration... When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, He shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So it says, Ye which have followed Me in the what? In the regeneration. The regeneration is, you know, the, the resurrection. Those that have followed Me in the resurrection, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, He shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So let me give you a little history lesson here. Before Jesus' time, there was two kingdoms. The first, the kingdom split off after, you know, you had David, and then you had his son who lost the kingdom, and then you had the northern kingdom of Israel, and you had the southern kingdom of Judah. The ten tribes went to the northern kingdom of, of Israel. And you had like two, well, I guess three. You basically had Benjamin, the Levites, and Judah that went to the southern kingdom, and the other ten tribes were in, were in the northern kingdom. All right? And, you know, there was a... So basically what happened, the northern kingdom was much more wicked than the southern kingdom. So God judged them first. They got taken over by the Assyrian Empire about 120 years or so before Babylon took over Judah. All right? And Assyria came in and they, they basically took everyone away and they just brought all their people in. And the, it's called the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel for a reason. Because they were just, they were just basically just bred out of existence. Assyria came in and wiped them out and just basically came in and just they intermixed with each other. And pretty soon you had these people in Jesus' time called the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were the result of the ten tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, you know, mixing with all these other different people from the Assyrian Empire and other nations and whatever. So no one knew at that time who was of who. So there was really, in Jesus' time, that the Jews were only, you could really only identify three tribes at that time. It was Benjamin, Levi, Levi and uh, Judah. That's why Paul says, I'm of Benjamin. So he knew at that time. Now, today, no one has any idea. If you've ever seen the a a documentary, uh, Marching to Zion, they actually interview Jewish rabbis today. No one can, has any idea what tribe they are anymore. I mean, it's impossible. Jesus said, you know, forget about ge genealogies. Ju Judaism is a religion today. So when we talk about it's tough to get a Jew saved, we're talking about someone who's following the religion of Judaism. That's what we're talking about. Because no one has any idea what tribe that they're from. No idea. So what does he say when he's saying that they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, don't you think that back in the northern kingdom of Israel and back, you know, in Abraham's day and Isaac's day and Jacob's day that people believed, you know, on the Messiah, on the coming Messiah, that people got saved. We already talked about this. That Abraham's faith was the same as our faith. So these are, these, the disciples are going to rule and reign over the resurrected Old Testament saints. That's what this is talking about. It's the only thing that makes any sense at all. All right? There are no 12 tribes today. 
You know, and it would, it would be against what Jesus actually said to be like, oh, you know, you magically found out you were of some tribe. It, it, there is no Jew nor Greek. Amen. You know, we're all of one blood. You know, there, there, is, there is no point of genealogies today. The, the Samaritans were despised by the Jews of their day. You know, the ten tribes of Israel were already gone by the time Jesus got on the scene. Look at John uh, 4, verse 9. I mean, we could study the Samaritans for, for an hour too, but just look at John 4, verse 9, where the Bible says, this is the woman at the well. Jesus walks up to this Samaritan woman, and then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? Samaria, For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews considered them unclean. I mean, they came from those ten tribes. Yet the Jews at that point considered them unclean. So this is talking about the millennial reign of Christ. The twelve disciples will rule over the Old Testament saints. You know, that is the turning of ungodliness from Jacob. That, you think there's going to be ungodliness in the millennial reign of Christ? No. I mean, unless you think that all of a sudden, you know, there's some magical thing that's going to happen to the, you know, Israel today, and they're just going to become like all believers in Christ in, you know, overnight or something. But that's not what the Bible teaches about how you actually get saved. The Bible says that it's, a, it's an individual belief in your heart. And it's an issue of your heart. So God has not changed the gospel. God has not changed the path of salvation since the beginning of Genesis chapter 1. Amen. So he's not going to change it. Amen. So all this teaching that there's going to be this miraculous you know, salvation of, of some religion. It's a religion. There's not even any genealogies anymore. So it makes no sense. It's resurrected Old Testament saints, folks. It's the only thing that makes any sense at all. Look down at uh, Romans 11, verse number 27. For this is my covenant unto them, that I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, the election of grace, remember, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, talking about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God has never repented of the calling of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were flawed men. They weren't perfect men by any means. They made a lot of stupid decisions, they did a lot of dumb things. But God never repented of that. He brought the Messiah out of that line, like He said He was going to, like He promised that He would. Verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so, he's talking to the Gentiles again, even so these also now not believe, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon them. So he's saying that the people that he's had mercy on, through belief, the Gentiles, that's the way the Jews will get saved. Through you! The Jews will get saved by the unbel unbel previously unbelieving Gentiles. The Gentiles got saved. They will go. They will preach the gospel to people, including the Jews, and pe including people who follow Judaism today. And some will get saved. That we may save some, Paul says. Look, salvation is available through Gentiles preaching the gospel. That's what he's saying. All right? So God is speaking on a macro level here, folks. You know, God chose to use the unbelief of the Jews to have mercy on the Gentiles. And He'll use the Gentiles to preach the gospel to the Jews. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Look, everyone will hear the gospel until the end through those who are sent to preach it. And that's you. Amen. That's you. And if you don't preach it, People aren't going to hear it. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 11, verse 33. We're almost done. The Bible says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Isn't that true? How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Nobody. Or who hath first given to him that it shall be recompensed unto him again? Again. For him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. 
So really, folks, Romans 11 is not hard to understand as long as you understand that he's talking about the, the, the nation of Israel at his time and the curse that is put upon Israel. I can see it today. We are, look, I don't hate J the Jews. I don't hate somebody who's following the Jewish religion. But they, they, if they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they die, they're going to burn in hell. Yeah. Just like anybody else. So this false teaching that you know, somehow they have some, some privilege or they're God's chosen people. You know what? That's, that's, an, that's, that's a disservice to them if somebody doesn't tell them the truth. You know, I had my background, just so you guys know, I, didn't, I, didn't, I came from you know, a Lutheran background and there was really no end times um, philosophy taught in the Lutheran church. So when I got saved, it was really, I didn't have all this other stuff in my head. But let me just tell you from a, from a neutral standpoint, reading what the Bible says about the end times, how it's all going to play out, especially concerning the nation of Israel or Judaism today, it makes perfect sense. What is being taught in mainstream Christianity today is, is very confusing. It's very confusing. And it, it ultimately, it makes no sense. My first Baptist pastor that I ever had was, was one of these people. He was, he was saved. He had the right gospel, but he was just like, the Jews are God's chosen people. And, uh, and he's like, anyone that does anything bad to Israel, you know, there's going to be bad things that happen to that country and all this weird stuff that's not in the Bible. And, and I just like, I'm a logical person, so I just asked him one day, I said, look, if a Jew dies and doesn't believe in Jesus, where do they go? And he's like, well, hell. I'm like, all right. So what does being God's chosen person get you? What does that buy me if I end up in hell no. anyway? Good. Right? It, may, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what does it buy me? What benefit do I get out of that? A, a title? It, it doesn't make any sense. You can't, you can't think it through logically. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't go. There'd be no miraculous regeneration outside of indi individual belief. That's all the Bible teaches. All the Bible teaches is that belief on the Lord Jesus Christ is a matter of your heart. Your belief is yours. How many times have I said this? It's the only thing that's only all and no one can ever take it away from you. No one can conv convince you to change it. Your belief is uniquely yours. Amen. That's, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of that salvation is by belief. Yeah. It's yours. So it's your it's your heart issue to deal with. And it's always going to be like that for every individual person on this planet, no matter what religion they are. So to believe that some religion has some benefit, they're going to end up in hell. Yeah. The Muslim, if he doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to end up in hell. Right. I mean, the Buddhist is going to end up in hell. I don't care how nice he is or how long he sits under a tree, he's going to burn in hell right. if he doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the Jew today. It's not an issue of race or, or genealogy. It's, it's a religion that does not accept Christ. And people that follow that religion are, are under this curse that they rejected Christ. They need the gospel. So the gospel of salvation has and always will be the same, folks. And, and Paul is advocating for his people He's advocating for his people. He wants them to be saved. That's what he's talking about. And if they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to be saved. That's, right. All right? That's what Paul is talking about in Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the book of Romans. We thank you for um, these, these three chapters, Lord. We, we ask that uh, you just be with us and, and help us understand um, the word, Lord, and just you know, reject extra biblical uh, doctrine, Lord, that just takes verses out of context and just help us know the truth. And we thank you for the Bible. Um, we thank you for this church, Lord, and just help us be bold and clear when we preach your word to others uh, so we just may save as many as we possibly can. Um, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.